episode of the Beirut Banyan. And we're joined today by Mazen Al Hassan, Wissam Al Hassan's elder son. We were meant to meet in Martyrs Square today, in downtown, during the protests, and the roads are blocked, the highway is shut down. Mazen is up north, I'm here in Beirut, and I decided to break my own rule here and do the interview over the phone. Uh, the episode covers what is happening right now. This is now one week into the demonstration. Uh, Mazen shares his personal views, uh, his political views, and of course the, his relationship with his father. Uh, the commemoration of his father's assassination just passed on October 19. It's been seven years now since Wissam al Hassan's assassination. Um, my father is buried next to Wissam al Hassan in Martyrs Square. My father was assassinated just over a year later. And I reached out to Mezen wanting to hear his views. And I know that uh, he has a, a, a common pain, uh, a shared personal wound, and uh, we're both determined to keep going to Martyrs Square, to the protests, and for, in his case, in Tripoli, and I think he'll be back in Beirut as soon as he can. So we are, um, we have common destiny, and we have uh, mutual appreciation for genuine sacrifice when it comes to the Lebanese state. I wanted to hear his words his way, and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Beirut Banyan. I'm Rani Shatah with Mazen Al Hassan. <laughs> And I'm I'm honored that we're doing this today. Um, it's actually it's it's quite special that we had we had planned to meet this afternoon. And of course, because of what's happening, not just in Beirut but throughout the country, our uh, the the road from Tripoli to Beirut is pretty much blocked. So uh, I'm breaking my own rule here, deciding to do this over the phone. Um, I hope that uh, all we want to say will be shared one day in person, but for the meantime, it'll have to stay through uh, through the uh, phone data that may be, in a way, triggered a lot of what we're watching right now. Um, regardless, it's, it's a privilege to speak to you, and um, Mazin, can you just, for a moment, just step back in time a bit? Uh, we, we, we have perhaps common fate, uh, both of our fathers paid the ultimate price for this country. Uh, just right now, in, just your instinctual gut feeling, your emotions here, do you think these protesters are living up to our father's expectations of what they wanted from this country? Do, do you see eye to eye with all that is happening right now in Beirut and Tripoli and throughout Lebanon? Can I can I just uh, ask you what do you mean by he would have prevented this? What what do you mean by that exactly? When when they say the, that 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 sentence, what, what does that mean exactly? I mean, they would pretty much say like these protests would die; they would not last that long. And I pretty much say that these protests are the product of those who gave their life to for this country. 
you know, uh, it's of course it doesn't it doesn't uh, there's no need for an introduction here. Your father was Wissam al Hassan, and um, he's buried in Martyrs Square. Uh, the the uh, commemoration of, of that assassination just took place over the weekend, October 19, uh, 2012. And uh, my father was assassinated just over a year later, and they're buried side by side in Martyrs Square. For me personally, just seeing people flocking to Martyrs Square, standing by those two tombs, and of course by many other people that, that died, and are buried there. It is it is a good feeling. I feel for the first time that this space in the heart of Beirut is being used for the right reason. It's not deserted. It's not empty. It's shared by the common person who wants a better Lebanon. And I don't know, have you been to the Darih since the protests began? Have you actually made it down to, uh, to, to Martyrs Square? Yeah, I've made it there. I didn't go exactly to my father's tomb because it was so crowded, but I was actually there, like, overlooking the grave. Yeah. And and does that sentiment, is it shared with you that, that in a way that this is a space that is now being used to its fullest extent? This is what Martyr Square is all about. Yes, it is. Uh, it serves uh, the purpose uh, for the protesters. It's meant for people to be there because every time I go there, I find it empty. It's it kind of like, you know, it hurts a little bit. Yeah, I... I these people yeah. gave their lives for their country and it's empty. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I feel exactly the same way. I um, I want to maybe gauge your mind here because, I mean, you're, we're, we're, I think, a good 15 years apart in age. Did I get it right? You're in your early 20s? Uh, 24. You're 24. Okay. Well, <laughs> I forget how old I am. I'm in my late 30s. So yeah, we're we're 15 years apart. But we we're in the same generation, the post-war generation that cares a lot about the politics of this country but didn't have the tools necessary to bring about real structural change. Do you think these demonstrations and we're we're going to get into what's happening outside of Beirut, of course, and especially now that you're in Tripoli as well. But do you think these massive protests, and I think up to half of the country at any point is on the streets now, do you think they are demanding fundamental change for this country? Or do you think that this is just a, an outburst of anger at the economic decline of Lebanon? What, what, what do you see these protesters really, really demanding at the end of the day? Can I maybe I'll, I'll probe a little deeper here? Do you think that th this system that you know your father, my father, our, our grandparents, our great grandparents, and us as well this this way of power sharing among confessions in Lebanon? Do you think that this is a this system is genuinely under threat at the moment, or do you think because we know how entrenched it is in this country, do you think that it will? potentially outlast the street and and the, and the demonstrations and I ask you this because you're you're younger than me you've grown up in the I mean you don't you don't have you don't have any memories of the war so you are literally from the you know from the rebirth from the civil war and on but we have a sectarian system that is so so deeply embedded psychologically and and politically do you do you think it has the strength to outlast all this moment in our history? No, I don't believe it's going to outlast this moment in history, but I think it's part of it are going to remain in the psyche of people, at least the older generation, because the further we go from the civil war, the less pain there's going to be uh, in the population. Because, for example, me being born after the civil war, 
I feel pretty detached from it, despite what my family members or what my friends, parents, or grandparents may have gone through. Well, can you can you maybe just elaborate on that? And what what do you mean by that? What is different between you and your parents when it comes to that that sort of relationship to the system itself? I mean, like if we're gonna talk about the civil war and the system itself, the I believe the scars of the civil war are still fresh in our parents' minds and all the population's minds. This is why it's very hard to detach themselves from any kind of, I'm not going to say hatred, hatred is a strong word, but distrust towards the other sex. But like as we go further into the generations, this distrust kind of melts away because we're mixing in with each other. There are people who are advocating for civil marriage between different sex. There are people who are just finding no basis to judge of people of color to order uh, Yeah. And, and do, I mean, so the ultimate goal here would be, and remember, this is, of course, just a subjective opinion here. Do you think the ultimate goal is a secular system as opposed to this way of power sharing among, among sects? Is it, is it really secular yes. governance at the end of the day? Yes, of course. A secular system is probably the right way to go. I'm not even going to say probably it is the right way to go. I mean, I, I'm not against religion being in people's cultures, but we need to make sure that there's a difference between religion itself and someone's personal life and integrating religion and politics. And we all know that it never worked well. Now, I'm seeing, of course, I mean, you, you're in Tripoli, and Tripoli shined. Over the weekend, it became a world-famous city for throwing what looked like a, a genuine party. And a, I mean, a, a true moment of, of joy. And we were both from Tripoli. And we know that th the labeling of that city is always unfortunate. It's almost dismissed as a, as a city of extremists and, and rigidity and conservatism. And, and the things that are hard really to, to digest because we're from there. And at the same time, maybe there, there are hints of truth in some of that sentiment, it is clearly not Beirut, but it is also not the extremist den people people throw the, the accusations left and right towards it. But that, that moment where you had people, the average person, partying in Sehet Noor, the entrance of, of Tripoli's downtown, do you think that the massive community that showed up there and regardless of what confession they're from, even if they're all from the same confession, I don't think it really matters. But do you think that they yearn for the same system that you're describing? That it's not just the Beirut middle upper class <clears throat> that wants a secular state. It's not just the AUB crowd. It's not just the whatever you want to call it, the, the, the liberal segment of the population. Do, do you think that the protesters in Tripoli are also demanding for a secular state. And I know you don't you can't speak on behalf of every protester, but the sentiment, do you think it's that's the sentiment at, at the core of what was going on at Tripoli? Yeah, I, I, like you said, I'm not gonna speak for all the protesters because I don't know every single one of them, but I think the majority just wants the secular uh, way of uh, governing the country. And even before the protest, because I have so many friends in Tripoli, I know their sentiment from people who are from religious families to people who are from families that are disconnected from religion. They all hear for the same thing. I mean, when I go, for example, to Mina, I meet people from all kinds of confessions, and it's very really hard to imagine that a city with a reputation of being fundamental is having people from all confessions, for example, gathering at the bars, gathering at the nightclubs, getting no sorts of nightlife that may be uh, shunned upon by uh, religious uh, individuals. And what we saw happening, of course, not just in the north, but in the south. The, these brave protesters in Nabatiye, in Sur, challenging their leadership. I mean, it's, the reason I'm, I'm going deeper into this is because I'm... I think, personally, I think those are the moments that are going to remembered, be remembered most later on. That the whole country rose up. It wasn't just Beirut. Unlike other protests that have happened throughout Lebanese history. All parts of the country, at, at the same moment, were demanding change. But do, do you think 
And I, I say this because of the genuine fear that has persisted among communities in Lebanon. Do you think that there is an actual way, an actual platform available to actually maybe keep that fear at bay and and show that a secular alternative will will keep everyone safe in this country? Because it it seems so embedded and it's not, of course, it's not it's not the ideal situation because it's failing. It's failing it fails repeatedly. But is there a way to actually ensure that respective communities feel safe in a system that no longer works as a sort of a, a preservation of minority rights within the country? And I'm, I'm asking you this also because I know that you're, you studied political science and you're, I mean, this is in a way, maybe it's your, it's your field and it's your, it's your work. So what do you think about that? Keeping, keeping fears at bay, how can that be implemented properly? If, if this system actually does collapse? I mean, if we want to keep that fear at bay, first of all, we need to make sure that all sects are united under uh, one citizenship. It's the idea that, I mean, under the sectarian system, we first identify ourselves by our sex in Lebanon. And I find that very wrong because we're all Lebanese in the end. And it doesn't matter if someone is Christian, Jew, Shia, Sunni, we just all have the same rights because under the current system, our rights are very different from each other, despite us living under the same roof that is Lebanon. So you, I get, I get a sense of genuine optimism, uh, 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 like hope from your end that you're not skeptical about the fate of these protesters. You really think that there is change, or there is an expectation of real change on the horizon. Yes, I have. Uh, I'm very optimistic, despite like. Most people around me, uh, at least in my village, they're kind of skeptical about these protests because they say, it. I mean, it's funny because I, I see it from my side, I see it from the other side. They all say that it's kind of a conspiracy against one certain leader. And I say, no, it's not a conspiracy because they're all under the same, uh, how to explain it? They're all under the same uh, veil of criticism. They all uh, abide by the same sectarian system and they all need to go. It's not a conspiracy against anyone. People just need to realize that this is just the population's genuine feelings. And even though there may have been two million people on the ground, I'm pretty sure at least half of those who are at home are with the protest. They just either don't have the means to go to the protest or they just are still afraid of showing their faces at the protest. But can I, I mean... We can go as far as you want on this on this end. What do you mean by afraid to criticize the leadership? Are you are you talking here on on a sectarian scale, or are you talking on the leadership from the north, like Tripoli politicians in general, that they're afraid to challenge their their respective leader in in Tripoli or the surrounding uh, surrounding villages? No, the idea that I've been thinking about since the protest started is that. Some people are afraid of criticizing their leaders, not because of their sex, but because of the clientelist system of the sectarian uh, regime. It's the idea that, well, if these protests fail, and they know that I've been participating in these protests and I've criticized them, I might lose whatever I still had left of a chance to live a normal life in this country. Because oh, so... Because not, these so, leaders are the providers of all the services to the Lebanese people, at least three-quarters of them. So if I understood you right, you're talking about Wasta here, the connections that are, the, the sickness of the country, the corruption. Is that... Uh, yep. So, okay, so this is a fear for their livelihood, in other words. It's an economic fear, more than a political yes, fear. I have to admit, I'm not immune to that fear. I mean, yeah. like, what I criticized the uh, Hariri, I've been thinking that, well, maybe if these protests failed, I might be at the end of the barrel of the gun that might be it turned on the people who went to the protest. Can I ask you, Mezen, you I mean, I, 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 this is a back and forth between us, and I, I'd like to gauge your mind because you are the son of a martyr. And you are you, the reason you're in downtown, I think, is both hope for the country and justice for your father's legacy. I'm speaking, of course, on behalf of you here, because I, that's, that's my sentiment. 
and maybe you share it the same way, maybe you don't. But that this this duty to the state, and you're you're I mean you're you're risking what you said is potentially true. You're risking tarnishing your pers- your prospective WASTA credentials later, <laughs> which is such a sickness in this country anyway. It shouldn't matter. Your right your right to free expression should include. Whatever you want, you can sound smart or stupid. You can be critical of the regime or support the regime. It's entirely up to you. I want I want to gauge your mind on this. Do you think at this stage, at this stage of the demonstrations, now it's it's about a week long now. We're we're in the sixth day. Do you think this is the time for the prime minister to resign? I honestly wait. Hold on. Give me a second. I need to. Ha <laughs> ha! That's the best censorship I've ever seen in my life. The cat, the cat bites you. <laughs> just, just give me a second. You can edit this out. Well, I don't know. It depends. Uh, is the cat holding you hostage or? <laughs> no, I think it just wants some company, but I can't give it to her right now. Just give me a second. Sure, of course, of course. <laughs> Well, the cat is now part of the episode. <laughs> I love the timing is perfect. So let's let's go let's go back. I'll let you answer as much as you feel comfortable answering. As a citizen, as a patriot, as somebody who's passionate and and cares deeply about the future of Lebanon, do you think it's time for the prime minister to step down? talking about now a, a uprising against Ba'abda, against Aynatini, against every respective MP. Did, did I get you right? That it's not, it shouldn't just be a Dem al-Sarai, it should be in front of all corners of power or state institutions. Yes, exactly. Do you, do you see that momentum though? Because I'm, I mean, this is speculation, I'm, we're watching the same coverage. When we're not on the street, we're simply watching the same stations, watching the protests. Do you see the potential for the president to step down or the speaker of parliament to step down? Because clearly you're right. I mean, what you're saying is, is accurate, that the system is not just one man. It's not just the prime minister. It's the whole state. Do you see other corners of the state? And this includes, this includes non-state actors. The, our, our unfortunate, famous state within a state. Do you see protesters going to Dahi demanding Hezbollah disarm? I mean, we're talking now real refer- real, a real revolution in the country. Are, is, is that in the making here? Or is that sort of maybe beyond the scope of what's happening at the moment? I mean, I think for now, it's still at the core the Yeah, there's that. 
but so I, okay, here I'd like to challenge you, to, and this is a, this is just a friendly debate here. Do you think that weapons, a disarming of of non-state weapons, and a an attempt at establishing sovereignty and independence, pretty much the March 14 momentum that that was that unfortunately died years ago. Do you think that is the precondition for economic reform? Or do you think it's the other way around? That the economic reform is a is one step towards an eventual reestablishment of sovereignty and independence? I mean, see, the thing is that they're both intertwined together because we can have as much economic reform as we want, but as long as these weapons still exist in the country, we're going to be isolated from the world economy because we're going to still be linked to Iran and uh, Syria who are pretty much isolated from the international community and this is not going to benefit Lebanon in any way. So there is still a big elephant in the room that regardless of what happens at the moment domestically, on the economic and and the political level, that there is still that big issue that is yet to be determined. Yes, I mean, unless these weapons are turned into the army or that Hezbollah's military wing is integrated to the army and becomes independent from Iran, we're still, maybe the sectarian system will go, maybe we'll have a secular system, but we're still going to be economically isolated from the world And maybe just uh, a bit of your final thoughts here. You're young. I'm unfortunately <laughs> getting older, but I'd like to say I'm, I'm still young enough. Do you think, as our parents paid the ultimate price, as our fathers paid the ultimate price for this country, do you think that we will have our children growing up in a better Lebanon? And let's, and I mean, I'm talking forecasting 20, 30 years from now. We're both potential fathers, or even grandfathers. Do you think we'll have generations of our own family in the future living in a better country? Yes, I'm very optimistic that the future generations are going to live in a better country eventually. It might be a slow process, but I'm seeing things are getting better, and these protests are the first step for things to get better. I mean, people are still very adamant on saying the truth despite what the army is trying to do despite what the politicians are trying to do people are still adamant they're still going to the country I mean I have a friend who's been in these protests for seven days straight and he's still not giving up and I know a lot of people who are not giving up do you th- and I, I just want to gauge your mind on this that do you think it's a benefit that these protests are without leadership that there's no visible face yet determining where this protest goes. Do you think that's a it's a benefit to have not one person sort of leading it? Or do you see it as maybe a potential sign of that it'll it'll lose momentum because there isn't a voice sort of above? Because I, I I compare this to March 14 that March 14 that the these voices emerged quickly and you, you saw that there were multiple leaders emerging all on the same page, at least for a moment. Up until now, there isn't one person, or there isn't even a team of people. It's literally leaderless. What what do you see with that? Is it is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it both at the same time? I mean, as long as these protests are still going, I think it is a good thing because the politicians don't have a head to target. At least politically, I'm not gonna say like try to take out physically, but like they don't have a certain leadership to target, they don't have a certain leadership to criticize, to find any kind of scandals on. But in the long run, eventually, like, worst comes to worst, if we're just going to have uh, an earlier election, but still have the same system, yes, I think we need to have a leadership, because this leadership is going to be able to, uh, how to explain it, take away seats from the parliament, from these uh, parties, so the current establishment is unable to reform. That's what I'm getting from you at the end of the day. The, the, current, the current crop, they cannot be held to account because they, are, they have failed for so long. We need a fresh slate. At the same time, though, at the same time, we don't know who that is yet. 
Did I did I get that right? That we don't we don't have yet the the actual names on the list. We don't have a platform that we can just sort of bring into the state and say these are the people, these are the independent people we want. We're not there yet. Did I did I get that right? Yeah, we're not there yet. I mean, I, I'm part of a group of uh, doctors, teachers, professors, and uh, even uh, student bodies who are working on plans to actually present to the people and uh, hear their suggestions, what do they want, what kind of leaders they want. So, so far, it's still leaderless, and so far, I think it's that's still a good thing, because as long as it's leaderless, people are able to rally around one thing, it's the fact that we're all Lebanese, and every Lebanese citizen is going down on the Well, I, I go back to what you said earlier. I think uh, Wissam al-Hassan and Muhammad Shatah buried side by side in Martyrs Square. I think, just as you said, they're both smiling right now. And I appreciate your optimism. And I really I appreciate your time. I know things are very tense at the moment and things are moving quickly. We couldn't meet in person today, I, but I really hope to see you in Martyrs Square in the coming days, even in Tripoli as well. So I really appreciate your time, Mazin Hassan, and uh, good luck with all that's coming. Thank you very much. I also appreciate it. It kind of it feels nice to actually speak my mind for once on, uh, with someone, even though I'm not very uh, familiar with, but it still feels nice to speak my mind and maybe have other people uh, listen to it. Well, I guarantee you there's an audience uh, very eager to hear what you're saying. So... I appreciate it, Mazen. Thanks. Thank you. A voice of hope from the north, the elder son of Wissam al-Hassan, Mazen al-Hassan. I... Uh, I relate. I relate because it's a shared pain and it's a, it's a shared determination to get the state back on its feet and to rebuild it properly. And I really hope that his optimism persists and I hope these demonstrations continue and I really hope real change is on the horizon. I'll keep these episodes going as quickly as possible. And once again, a, an apology for the quick edits and all that. I'm delivering them as fast as I can. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>